As I mentioned earlier, Professor Banerjee is the director of ARIES. He's also a senior professor at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, where his research focuses on the sun and how it affects the space weather. Throughout his career, Professor Banerjee has participated in eclipse expeditions throughout the world, where he conducted experiments during the total solar eclipse. He was a visiting professor at the Center for Plasma Astrophysics in KU Levin, Belgium, and worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the United Kingdom's Armagh Observatory, where he studied the dynamics of the solar atmosphere using data from solar, solar and heliospheric observatory satellite, the SOHO satellite. Today, Sir is going to talk about the Sun and Aditya L1. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sruti. Uh, good morning, uh, students. Uh, so at it, as it has been pointed out, I'm a, a solar physicist uh, from uh, 80s currently, but I am almost, uh, you know, born and brought up at uh, IIA Bangalore. I'm also affiliated with this institute called ISER Kolkata, uh, and I'm actually presenting it on behalf of the Aditya L1 Science Working Group. As you can see from my slide, there are many logos. Of course, the most prominent is the ISRO logo in the, in the front. So there, these kind of projects actually involves, uh, you know, hundreds of people. Uh, often it can turn into thousands. And uh, many institutions across India are directly involved with this, uh, you know, project. So I will not be in a position to uh, say specific names, but be aware that this kind of mission uh, includes uh, people, scientists, engineers, students, postdocs at different levels to participate. So I will try to give you a flavor about, um, uh, you know, why do we, you know, study sun? Uh, what are the interesting uh, unknown problems uh, related to the understanding of the solar phenomena? And then I will introduce you uh, to this uh, mission, our own mission called Aditya L1. And... Uh, address that what are the problems which we are going to address with that of course i will keep my you know uh, level of uh, discussions at a very elementary level but feel free to you know pose your questions in the chat box and i have requested my colleagues uh, you know uh, from space india to uh, prompt me those questions uh, whenever they are relevant to so feel free to uh, pose your questions uh, relevant to the slide which i am uh, covering at any point and i will try to you know address it either during the uh, session or after my presentation as well so this is our uh, nearest star the sun of course the sun uh, what we see in the sky the visible surface is called the photosphere we can't see uh, what is happening inside the sun but through observations we have fair bit of knowledge actually what is happening inside this star uh, and, uh, you know, I won't be going into details, but, you know, what happens is the energy is generated deep in the inside called the core through a thermonuclear reactions. And then uh, about, you know, up to 70 percent interior, the energy is propagated through radiation process. This is called radiative zone. And then last 30 percent, the sun is convective. You know, it's like a boiling soup and uh, the energy is propagated through convection and now we also understand that the dynamics of the sun incidentally the sun's outer atmosphere is governed by the presence or absence of magnetic field and this magnetic field is generated inside this convection zone uh, and now it is believed that the probably the magnetic field is uh, you know produced at the base of the convection zone down here and the Depending on the nature of the magnetic field structure, different uh, you know kind of structures are seen in the atmosphere. Here you see a beautiful you know prominence. These are uh, chromospheric features. It's about thousand to two thousand kilometer height. You know it can extend to. Also, you see uh, these extended structures. These uh, these regions of the sun is called corona, and you see beautiful streamer kind of uh, shape here. Uh, you will find some kind of rays here uh, uh, and then there are certain structures where you will not find that much of emission these are called coronal holes and so on so sun actually provides lots of different structures and these structures are governed by the presence or absence of the magnetic field 
because of the variability of this magnetic field now we uh, also know that there are these kind of very dynamic uh, you know events take place here is a picture of the sun taken from nasa's solar dynamic observatory and these images are taken in extreme ultraviolet uh, you know wavelengths they are shorter wavelengths they represent plasma temperature of millions of kelvin so that means they're very hot material and what we could see here that these hot materials are confined into these kind of region underneath these regions there is a presence of magnetic field probably you have heard uh, these regions are called sunspots sunspots have been observed for more than 400 years through small telescopes and now with the space era now we are able to now get a much more details about these sunspots and how the different sunspots are connected with these kind of mag magnetic structures these are called magnetic uh, loops it's like if you if you have done any of you uh, you know experiments in bar magnet if you sprinkle you know uh, iron fillings you will see that the iron fillings are taking a shape uh, coming from the north pole of the bar magnet to the south pole it, it is always form some kind of uh, loop structure and here also we see the similar behavior there are multiple magnetic polarities here underneath sunspots are there and they are confined uh, they are providing these structures but but because of certain instability i mean if you can provide lots of motion or twist in these then you will find that whatever material was there it will be ejected these are called coronal mass ejections and the phenomena which uh, you know results into this is called the solar flares and again uh, another very interesting aspect of studying solar physics is uh, if there are students from other branches i can say that the sun provides us a ideal laboratory for studying different branches of physics here it is again the picture of the sunspots they are always a bipolar one polarity is uh, say north here depicted by black and the uh, south is depicted by white and today we have much uh, bigger telescopes and we could see much more details about these sunspots so these are the interior of the sunspot then there are other structures and then at the sides you see this sun is convective as i said underneath it uh, if you could uh, recall your uh, you know boiling soup uh, picture on the top of the ball you will find very similar network kind of structure so this is what uh, is seen on the surface of the sun and these tons, uh, sunspots are very uh, strongly magnetized uh, object of the size of uh, tens of thousands of kilometer with a kilo gauss kind of field and so on so you can imagine that they will be really be able to confine lots of hot material we call them plasma because when you have these three states of matter uh, you have uh, you know uh, you have solid liquid and then the gas if you continue increasing uh, the temperature means you provide more and more heat you will find this uh, gaseous material will be you know uh, having ions and electrons and neutrals so these collection of different uh, charged particles uh, you know states are called plasma state of uh, uh, you know in in physics so in the sun we find that majority of the substances are, are all in the plasma state so here about these sunspots how they come about as i indicated the sunspots are now believed to be there uh, somewhere in the inside the convection zone and here in this animation you see that the sunspot like this flux tube you can imagine about this as a rubber tube you this rubber tube if you submerge in a bucket of water you know the rubber tube floats because the rubber tube is lighter than the surrounding so here also we are seeing the very similar behavior these rubber tubes have come out and that has given rise to uh, given rise to this kind of flux tube behavior and then maybe i should run this uh, uh, slide again and as you see here that when these white uh, lines uh, they are popping up from the surface uh, whereby generating this pair of sunspot one is uh, one polarity the other is another polarity they come up out but after a certain time if you provide lots of twists and turns then you will see that this tube is unstable you have a flare here and uh, you have an ejector this is called also solar storm so these solar storms have uh, okay. you know huge effect on our interplanetary space 
and uh, our space is uh, you know filled with lots of satellite and other assets so we need to pr protect those uh, satellites from these uh, solar storms okay, now uh, yeah. sir i have two questions from the students in sure. regards to sunspots okay where one student from is who vivian from kr mangalam is asking mm -hmm. how does the sun release magnetic waves to form sun and form sunspots Mm -hmm. And Aryan Mishra from St. Mary's School is asking why the sunspots occur. Okay, uh, both are very good questions. Uh, first of all, uh, sun is a rotating star. And also sun rotates not uniformly, but differentially. That means, you know, your equator is rotating faster than the pole. It's not a solid object. It's almost like a plasma ball. So if you can think about a jelly and if you start rotating, you will often see that this jelly is not rotating as a solid thing. You know, it gets D-shaped and typically the equatorial region, the central regions rotate faster and, than the pole. So this uh, rotation is a very important element for the generation of the magnetic field. And as I indicated, inside the sun, it is uh, convective also. So there is a lot of flow motions which is also, you know, twisting and churning these uh, uh, magnetic uh, tubes which are formed. So because of these combination of, uh, uh, you know, motions, uh, velocity fields and so on, magnetic field get generated. Now you can also have asked the question, where does this magnetic field come from? Essentially, when a sun uh, or any star of a solar-like star is born, from interstellar medium, it compresses. In the interstellar medium also, there is a very small magnetic field of the, uh, of the order of micro gauss. And when these interstellar matter gets compressed into form of a star, they actually take these uh, magnetic field and they get amplified. Now, we have a seat field, we call it a seat field to start with the phenomena, but it is hard to maintain a magnetic field. Like, you know, in the laboratory, when you have a uh, changing uh, electric field, that produces magnetic field. You turn off the you know, uh, current, your magnetic field will be gone. So here, this, uh, you know, this motion, because of the you know, star is rotating and convective and all that, gives rise to the generation of the magnetic field inside the sun. And these magnetic field structures are lighter than the surrounding. So that's why they, they come and pop up and they form the sunspot pairs. So I hope I, I have, uh, you know, answered your uh, question. We can get back to this again uh, if you have further queries. Now, these sunspots, as I mentioned, we have been observing them for last 400 years. Now, what is plotted here is yearly sunspot number against last time, last 400 years. You clearly see that there is an alteration. Like some, sometimes, you know, sunspot numbers are very high. Sometimes the numbers are very low. The time when the sunspots are uh, high in number, they're called maxima. So these are called solar activity maxima. And when the sunspots are very low, I mean, number of sunspots, what you see on the daily images are very low, or some days you may not find any sunspot for, for months to years, they're called minima period. So that means this magnetic activity of the sun is actually fluctuating. And typically, if you follow this uh, blue curve, you'll see that this periodicity is about 11 years. But then again, you can also see that no two, you know, these uh, uh, cycles are same. In last 100 years, around 1950s, we found this particular cycle was strongest. And then this period, you know, it was much weaker. If I go back to even 400 years, almost 1650 to 1700, there were hardly any sunspots recorded. What was the effect of that, uh, you know, absence of sunspots? Europe was extremely cold. The river Volga, which flows in Europe for a very large distance up to Russia, you know, it was frozen for 40 years. So that means the magnetic activity of the sun has a direct influence on our climate. So now we have gone back to several thousands of years and we have reconstructed this uh, solar cycle through proxy measurements. Sunspots were not measured before the telescope was discovered in 1600, but we have indirect measurements of cosmogenetic, uh, you know, other uh, elements. Through that, we find that there have been probably 20 odd, you know, uh, mini ice ages. 
So that means, you know, sun, uh, we have to really be monitoring it on a long term as well. Apart from the short term uh, variability, which I talked about because of the solar storms and all. So there are two, uh, you know, kind of uh, variability we need to really worry about. One is called space weather, which is impacting our, our, our satellite communications and the space assets. The other is the climate, space climate, because all this global warming and so on is uh, assuming that the sun is always radiating the same amount of energy, but it is not always uh, uh, you know, producing the same amount of energy. So what is plotted here is this sunspot number, and this is plotted as the total energy which is emitted, which is called also the irradiance, solar energy output, which now clearly is uh, 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 seen to be correlated with the solar cycle. So this is what is called the solar cycle. And this observation has been only possible once we started going to the space, because the variation is, if you look at this number, is 0.01%. It's a very, very tiny uh, chain. But this 0.01%, if it becomes 0.1%, that will have a devastating effect on our climate. So it is very, very important to go to space and monitor these you know, irradiance, total energy. Uh, uh, we are looking at integrated energy, but, you know, it is also important to look at specific wavelengths and all that. So that is a much, uh, you know, further, uh, you know, details required. So the total solar irradiance is coupled to the sun's magnetic output, which is shown here. In 30 minutes, sun provides enough energy to sustain annual needs, actually. It is a primary energy input to the global climate system. So if we really need to understand the climate, we really need to understand the solar energy output uh, at different wavelengths and, and so on. So how do magnetic fields govern these energy variations? So that means we have to understand the magnetic uh, variability of the sun as well. So here you see this movie from Soho, uh, as in the beginning it was pointed out, uh, solar and heliospheric observatories, another observatory which is there at Lagrange one point, and uh, we have been following this thing. So these are the huge explosions which happens in the corona. And uh, the, also there is another interesting aspect is this corona uh, plasma is at a very high temperature. Uh, normally, if you go away from the surface of, uh, say, Earth, you go to uh, Nainital or to even have the height, you will find the temperature drops. It's much cooler. But here, contrary to uh, that uh, understanding, we see if we go higher and higher up in the atmosphere of the sun, the temperature rises to millions of Kelvin. The surface temperature is 6,000 Kelvin and the coronal temperature is million Kelvin. And then on the top of that, you have all these, you know, huge magnetic structures. They are often stable for many days to weeks, but sometimes, you know, they do erupt and which gives rise to the solar storm. So we need to understand. So again, there is a magnetic storm and uh, then you can see that the size of the earth is just this much. So you could imagine how big this plasma structure is and the amount of material which is embedded in this uh, structure when it is thrown into the interplanetary space. And if it reaches us, thankfully, Earth has its own magnetic field. It is protecting us. But sometimes it, it is not able to protect us completely. And that, then we have devastating effects. So here, there is an a, you know, instrument we call Corona Graph which allows us to see these coronal mass ejections to large distances away from the sun. So this is what happens during the total solar eclipse. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Sruti has uh, pointed out in the beginning that we have been, uh, you know, looking for solar corona only from ground during the total solar eclipse expedition. But as you know, eclipses happen only for a few minutes uh, and our data becomes very limited and of course if you take uh, images from the ground you have lots of uh, you know other uh, constraints and the clouds and so on also affects your emission whereas if you go to space you have uh, really really beautiful you know images and uh, you know spectroscopic measurements and so on here i'm showing you the uh, the famous diwali storm it is also named uh, uh, because it happened during the diwali period in india and uh, you see these uh, huge energetic, uh, you know, uh, structures, they are traveling all the way. But as I indicated, um, uh, Earth has its own magnetic field. When these huge energetic structures, uh, you know, come out, when sun often gets grumpy 
and uh, sneezes large amount of energetic particles if that directed then cause havoc to our uh, our uh, you know environment but uh, thankfully because of the earth's magnetic field uh, we are protected but you can see here that if this magnetic uh, field is not really very uh, you know continuous or stable then some particles will try to penetrate what they do is they can't penetrate through these regions but they try to penetrate through the polar region that's how you see uh, you know other uh, phenomena i will come to that so this is a again a new movie from a parker solar probe this is a new uh, satellite from nasa which is going much much away from earth uh, it's almost uh, you know going to go very close to the sun at uh, you know 16 17 solar radii and that is able to see this you know coronal mass ejections with uh, with a fantastic uh, you know uh, kind of imaging uh, capability with lots of new results are coming out of that so uh, that's a real state of affair i'm sure you would be uh, very happy to uh, roam around in this kind of region uh, so none, none of the satellites also uh, are going to be very happy to roam around so all the commercial satellites will not be able to sustain this kind of environment parker solar probe was specially designed and all the you know uh, uh, instruments and the satellite components were were prepared for this kind of uh, ejecta there were huge losses in terms of power blackouts in north america this happened in uh, you know 13 march 1980 in 9 and uh, essentially these charged particles when they penetrate these earth's magnetic field you have this power grid and you know what happens is that charged particles carry a lot of uh, highly energetic uh, electrons and they produce uh, induced current in those uh, transformers and then you have disruption huge damages in in this transformers and uh, power line system and that will disrupt your power for many many hours in fact in canada it happened and uh, they had you know blackouts for several hours which uh, apparently uh, affected 3 million people and uh, the the insurance companies had to pay up uh, several billions of dollars so obviously you know that is not affordable Uh, so uh, thankfully because of these disruptions uh, you know solar physicists we are getting good funding to uh, predict these you know kind of uh, phenomena happening maybe you know you can uh, try to protect these things these also uh, a, a famous incident happened uh, in, in last year february 2022 uh, spacex is a uh, is a new uh, private company uh, who uh, launched starlink satellites and there was a solar storm which was not very big but what happened was because of the solar storm the interplanetary uh, you know fields were changed so when a satellite uh, travels into space it also subjects to uh, you know uh, drag forces because it is not going into the free medium it has uh, you know it has certain properties of the interplanetary space and the drag was completely changed because of the presence of this solar storm and the starlink uh, lost 40 uh, satellites because they never could reach their designated height of say 400 or 500 km in space so that's a huge loss again uh, you know which is not affordable so for all satellite launch it is important to know whether the sun is uh, comparatively quieter at that point of time and whether there is a likelihood of any storms so here you see that if we, you know if you are uh, do, going for a, a space uh, you know uh, journey then this kind of environment lots of so this particular picture was taken from soho again which is at lagrange one point uh, so when such particles come the 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 camera gets flooded with this kind of uh, uh, you know snow uh, which are essentially highly energetic particles they are very very harmful of course for human beings and uh, if you are planning for a space uh, travel this is not a right environment as well so thankfully you know only the rich people are planning for for big space uh, uh, travel and they are ready to uh, spend uh, money for our research to uh, get a appropriate time for their space uh, tourism as well so there are many such uh, you know uh, things this is what uh, happens uh, during the beautiful aurora as i indicated these charged particles when they enter into uh, the polar region they uh, interact with our um, our atmosphere so these are some chemical changes happens uh, some oxygen 5 and uh, so on gets uh, uh, charged ionized and then you get these beautiful colors so these are natural phenomena 
uh, because of the interaction of the solar energetic particles with Earth's atmosphere, uh, like, uh, you know, elements. So here, what is, uh, you know, uh, marked or uh, depicted here is the uh, area called uh, space weather. Uh, the ionosphere is filled with, uh, you know, uh, commercial satellites. We have, uh, you know, astronauts. Uh, we have, you know, <laughs> drag, as I indicated here. Are there any questions? Yes, so there's one question, which is, I think it's very interesting. Okay. So uh, Aryan Mishra, again from St. Mary's School, is asking, why can't we use these charged particles from the sun as a source of power? Okay, very good question. Uh, we do, uh, you know, uh, we are going to attempt to do that. But again, the power, what you can generate in the, say, in the, in the space, how you transmit that power, how you use that power uh, is will be a question. Since you asked the question, you know, in the space, all assets are basically surviving because of the solar energy. So we have lots of uh, solar energy. So we have solar panels. So we do get the energy primarily from the, uh, you know, solar uh, radiation. But since you again pointed out this, these energetic particles uh, carry, of course, a good amount of energy. But to trap them also, you need certain devices because uh, it is not easy to trap those energies. That means, you know, you have to have certain um, instruments or devices to capture those electrons in the first place. They're there everywhere. And those instruments are still going to be uh, quite, you know, uh, uh, demanding in terms of they need to have a, a voltage to trap them and so on. Since you asked this question, we are having three in-situ instruments in uh, Aditya mission. So, and we are going okay. to we are going to actually trap those uh, you know uh, energetic particles to understand their properties because some okay. are you know having just electrons, some could be heavy uh, ions. So, what is their charge to mass ratio and all that to get a better understanding? What kind of energy they carry and all that. We are going to have actually uh, particle instrument. We are having particle instrument. Oh, okay, that's and interesting. Actually detecting yeah. also, I will show you some very, very uh, preliminary, uh, you know, results from that as well. Okay, that will be very interesting to see. Thank you, sir. So here in this global map, uh, what you see here, here is that uh, these uh, solar energetic particles uh, and the uh, mass and, and magnetic field, which is carried by the coronal mass ejections can impact, uh, you know, a uh, lot of things uh, here. It can actually uh, impact your uh, aeroplanes, which goes primarily also, you know, these days there are long haul flights from Delhi. If you take a flight to, uh, to New York, you go through uh, close to the poles and you are susceptible to all these energetic particles, uh, which is coming from the sun. So if there is a big solar flares, you will be bombarded with, uh, you know, a lot of energetic particles. Not many people know about these things and that is not very healthy for our body. So, uh, and as I indicated, you know, um, the, all these, you know, radio wave communications uh, in our, uh, our day to day life, your WhatsApp will not be delivered, your GPS will uh, not work. And if your GPS doesn't work, you, you know, whatever is dependent on the GPS navigation, including the, you know, uh, uh, the drilling of uh, the, uh, of the, uh, of the pipes and, uh, and the fuels and so on, they are heavily dependent on the GPS uh, coordinate system. So all those things can get badly affected because of the you know uh, solar phenomena and we need to really know uh, uh, the timing of these uh, events when it uh, impacts uh, the satellite communication and these assets in the space so this area is called space weather and this is a very important area now there are a lot of private companies also coming into this place this space to uh, predict uh, uh, these things now i will slowly get into uh, aditya mission uh, what is plotted here is again solar cycle. Uh, uh, we started, uh, you know, this business way uh, back in 2005, around that time. Uh, there was a concept or a proposal for a low Earth orbit uh, mission. Low Earth orbit missions are, you know, small satellite program. And typically, you know, they take a weight of 100 kg uh, and uh, they last for uh, a few years and they only go up to 500 to 700 kilometers. Uh, so this was, uh, you know, originated uh, around 2006. A imaging coronagraph uh, at low Earth orbit was approved in 2009. We started working on uh, this coronagraph design. But then 2012, there was a big step 
Uh, in fact, this was just after our Mangalayan mission, which we went in very uh, big success. You know, ISRO also wanted to go farther distances and more adventurous mission, I would say. Low Earth orbit is a, a cakewalk for them, it appears now. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, the scientists and engineers do uh, require uh, challenges in, in the life. And our challenges are in the form of new, uh, new concepts and new missions. So, thankfully, this was really a big step forward for Indian science and ISRO's uh, space exploration program, I would say, that uh, ISRO uh, took a decision that uh, we will try to go to Lagrange point. If you go to Lagrange one point, of course, you need a much bigger satellite. You can have many more payloads. So there were uh, announcement of opportunity and then seven payloads were uh, selected. So it was a, a big, big step. Of course, we took uh, quite a while. We had COVID challenges. You know, labs were uh, almost non-functional because that is the time when, you know, integration of these different subsystems and calibrations and all that were expected to take place. But we came out of, uh, thankfully, COVID. And then uh, we delivered the payloads uh, to ISRO in the early uh, of this year. And the launch was 2nd September from Srihori Kota. So that's a sequence of things which, uh, which we were uh, fortunate to uh, you know, um, see from uh, Srihori Kota. The different phases, the payloads are delivered. And then this was the third day. Uh, we were thankfully inside. You can see me sitting here. Uh, this is the operation center. And uh, you know the countdown starts. Uh, and then it took almost an hour. Uh, there are different phases of the launch. It was launched uh, by the PSLV uh, XL, uh, you know, uh, and here you see the sequences of the, of the launch. It goes out. Uh, people went out to see. I couldn't man even uh, dare to uh, leave my seat uh, in intention. Uh, and uh, it was a fantastic, uh, you know, experience, a lifetime, uh, you know, experience. Uh, so that's the uh, sort of uh, view of different Lagrange one, uh, points. So for a two-body system, if you have a third test particles, there are uh, five Lagrange points. So uh, here it is Earth. Uh, Lagrange one point is here. Uh, Lagrange two is ideal for for nighttime astronomy, so to say. You know, deep sky. Uh, there is uh, there are quite a few uh, you know satellites there. The more recent one is the James Webb. Uh, L4 and L5 is still not populated. L3 is behind the uh, sun. So the difficulty of L3 is that you know, there won't be any communication to uh, Earth. So we have to find out uh, some other way of uh, if we even in uh, any distant future go to L3, how to transmit the data back. L4, L5 are very good vantage points. And we do have plans to uh, be there some uh, uh, sometime in future. This was the uh, Earth-centered uh, orbit uh, transfer. Uh, 2nd September, it was launched, and there were five such, uh, you know, uh, orbits. And then the slingshot around 22nd September midnight, we left the Earth Center orbit transfer, and then we uh, we took the cruise phase. We are very close to somewhere here. Of course, the perfect insertion is scheduled at 5th of January, and uh, we are all looking forward to that. But having said that, we are turning on, uh, you know, one by one some instruments for their health check. This was the first record of the particle detector. I think uh, I, Aryan asked this question. So uh, we did detect, uh, you know, from this aspects, uh, one of the particle detector made that uh, PRL and Ahmedabad has detected this fluxes. This is not still fully calibrated, but you know, we are, we are recording signals, I could say this. So this is what is, uh, you know, other satellites which are around Lagrange one, Lagrange 1 is a, a, is a fictitious point, as you can see here. Uh, we have to make a huge halo orbit around that. So it is not in one plane. Here from this simulation, you can see that it's almost like a, you know, Lissage's uh, figure in a three-dimensional uh, space. Essentially, uh, if, uh, you know, a satellite has to orbit around any point, it needs a, a you know, centripetal force. And that centripetal force will be supplied by the gravitational pull between sun and uh, the satellite and the pull between the satellite and Earth. So these two forces has to balance each other in such a way that the, uh, you know, our satellite around Lagrange 1 point can stay for a very long period of time without spending much fuel. So that is the, another big advantage of going to Lagrange 1 point, that you have a continuous view of the sun 
um, it is on the sun earth line so anything coming from the sun before it reaches earth it has to come through a lagrange point so you can remotely monitor what is happening in the sun and if something comes as i indicated those particles and the magnetic fields and all that we will be uh, measuring them in situ it's like you know you have a thermometer and you put it in your body and see what's the temperature so here also it almost like that the characteristics of these uh, huge coronal mass ejections and the uh, properties of the different uh, uh, particles and all that we will be able to study through these in situ instruments and with remote sensing instrument with the coronagraphs would be uh, you know watching the sun about its uh, variability so let me okay. just uh, sir, just a couple of questions before we go to the next point maybe I, I this is that. this yeah. um this is this is actually a bit advanced but many of the students after you mentioned solar flare and how it affects the earth many students have are wondering how will rdj l1 work when a solar flare hits it okay so uh, yeah this is a natural curiosity but i must point out that we are only going to 1% distance to the sun earth line we are still far away from the sun so that means you know we are only get, get uh, going 1.5 million kilometers so the 99% distance is still away so by the time the uh, you know uh, the solar flare uh, related particles and all that they come uh, it is not really a very harsh environment whereas i showed you a movie of parker solar probe which is actually going much closer and that has been designed for this so they are not actually directly looking at the sun at all they can't because they're too close they're looking away from the sun so we will see in that movie uh, sun was not visible so uh, in our case uh, uh, the environment is still you know uh, of course we are beyond the earth's magnetic field shield so we are exposed to these particles which normally uh, doesn't hit us when we are at earth but we have designed the instrument in such a way that they can be bombarded by this because we want to actually study their you know properties so all the instruments have been we call it tested or hardened through these uh, cosmic ray hits and uh, in the laboratory we decide on um, electronic components and all that after they're tested uh, by this hardening experiment so that's why a, a space experiment costs at least 10 times than a ground based experiment so this is already okay. taken care of. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, another question that the students have, let me just go and find it up again, is which layer of the sun will RDJ L1 okay. study? Yeah, I will hold on to this because I have some slides and I will I will uh, I will cover that question. I will keep okay, it. Okay, thank mind. you. If I don't, I just remind me at the end. Yes, I, so I will remind you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No, nothing else right now. Okay. You can proceed. Okay. So let me just run this movie. These are made by ISRO, and I hope you are able to uh, hear. The L1 mission carries a suite of seven scientific payloads to carry out systematic study of the sun. The Visible Emission Line Coronagraph, VELC, studies the solar corona and dynamics of coronal mass ejections. The Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope, SUIT payload, images the solar disk in near ultraviolet and also measures the solar irradiance variations. The Aditya Solar Wind Particle Experiment, Aspects and Plasma Analyzer Package for Aditya. Papa payloads study the solar wind and energetic ions as well as their energy distribution. The Solar Low Energy X-ray Spectrometer, Solexus, and the High Energy L1 Orbiting X-ray Spectrometer, Helios, study the X-ray flares from Sun over a wide energy range. The Magnetometer payload is intended to measure the interplanetary magnetic field at the L1 point. The science payloads of Aditya L1 are indigenously developed by different laboratories in the country. VELC is developed at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bengaluru, Suit Instrument at Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. Aspects Instrument at Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. Umpa Payload at Space Physics Laboratory, Vikram Saram High Space Center, Tiruvananthapuram. So Lexus and Helios Payloads at UR Rao Satellite Center, Bengaluru. 
and the magnetometer payload at the Laboratory for Electro-Optic Systems, URSC. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are at Lagrange 1 point. This is Earth's magnetic field, which gets a uh, bit distorted because of uh, continuous you know, flow of material and particles from sun. This is also called solar wind. On the top of that solar wind, you have these huge uh, coronal mass ejections. So we have uh, these ultraviolet imaging telescope, which is going to look at uh, the full sun images. We have uh, the coronagraph which will look at the corona. So suit will look at uh, the lower atmosphere to photosphere to chromosphere, and VLC will look at the coronal heights, which is beyond 2000 kilometer. And we have two X-ray spectrometers. So this is going to work as sun as a star. We do not have X-ray imaging capability in this uh, payloads, but we are going to look at the integrated flux, which is coming from the sun. So uh, Solex works in a slightly lower energy, uh, up to 30 kV, and Helios is going to work from 10 kV to 150 kV with a very good spectral resolution for, you know, studying the properties of the plasma's uh, conditions and all that. And at L1 point, we have these two particle detector called PAPA and Aspects, and the magnetometer, which is going to measure the magnetic field in the interplanetary space. And also when this huge coronal mass ejection comes, you can uh, imagine that they will travel through Lagrange 1 point and in situ, we'll be able to measure the properties of these coronal mass ejections. Mm -hmm. So Aditya is a multi-payload observatory class mission. I also should highlight that it is a multi-wavelength covering different atmospheric layers. What happens is uh, the our eye can only see the optical wavelengths, 6,000, uh, you know, kind of angstrom. Whereas when the plasma is heated to very high temperature, it emits in shorter and shorter wavelengths, namely in the ultraviolet and the extreme ultraviolet and X-rays. So really to understand a comprehensive uh, view of the solar atmospheric heights, you need to have multi-wavelength capability. So here it is. We have these four remote sensing instruments. This is the uh, Corona graph, which is built at IA Bangalore. This is the big elephant sitting at the top a deck. And this is the suit instrument. And all other instruments are actually comparatively much, much smaller. So you can imagine the, you know, uh, the usefulness or sort of the scientific capabilities or different kinds of observation possibilities with this, uh, you know, coronagraph instrument and the suit instrument. So these two are, uh, it's sort of, you know, heavy duty, uh, big instrument. This is the, you know, uh, uh, coverage of our multi-wavelength. What is plotted here is again, the electromagnetic uh, spectrum here. And uh, this is the coronagraph uh, wavelength uh, region. We have a suit uh, covering the ultraviolet. We have the Solex uh, and Helios covering this kind of energy uh, region, uh, which corresponds to these uh, wavelengths. The other thing which really we have to realize that, you know, when such a dejector comes from the sun, of course, it affects the other planets. And uh, uh, Earth is also there. So there are impacts of these things to the solar system overall. So now we are going to different uh, vantage points or different locations to really study, you know, when these radiations or uh, particles reach them. So for a comprehensive understanding of the sun planet interactions, this is a, you know, really, really the next, uh, uh, you know, era what we are working on. So it is not solar physics anymore. We call it heliophysics means, you know, sun, sun is helios and all the planetary systems and beyond because this cme is what you can see is it just not reaching and stopping at earth of course it depends also these cmes which is emitting from here it never reaches earth it only going to other directions so similarly these blue guys is not going to probably reach out or it will just glance through the uh, earth whereas this guy you know the main impact is on the venus not on uh, on our earth so we need to understand this 360 degree view of the sun so for that, we need, uh, you know, L5 mission, L5, L4 mission, and so on in future. This is what the suit is going to cover. As I indicated that the solar, this, what is plotted here is the uh, temperature of the solar atmosphere. Initially, the temperature slightly drops, but then uh, temperature increases to tens of thousands of Kelvin. And suddenly temperature goes into coronal heights, 
uh, beyond 2000 kilometer and these are different uh, you know region where uh, images are taken with through different wavelengths uh, different filters so here we are going to from the suit instrument we are going to focus on these regions on the solar atmosphere so uh, you can ask this question what all regions we will be uh, working on will be focusing on uh, with the suit instrument to these heights which covers uh, photosphere and chromosphere and uh, corona regions will be covered by the corona graph so that's the uh, you know plan are there a question mm, there's one question which is let me just find it again let me <laughs> I'm just, I'm, yes, yeah, so um, one student is asking, Prako, uh, Prashuk Jain from uh, NC Jindal Public School is that he wants to know if the RJ L1 has the power to control the sun's heat and the magnetic field. No, we don't have control on sun anyway. Sun is an independent star. It uh, covers 99.9% <laughs> of the solar system and uh, nobody can control sun. <laughs> Uh, uh, we are only here to monitor what is going to change in the sun and uh, what is the impact of that change going to be on our uh, you know, atmosphere or our neighborhood. That is the plan. Of course, physics-wise, we want to understand this star, which is called the sun, because once we understand a star, a sun, uh, you will be able to uh, probably in a better position to understand other stars or other galaxies. <laughs> because these are all astrophysical objects. So that way, from the astrophysics point of view, uh, the research on the sun is very, very important because the amount of details what we have from solar observations, we don't have for any other object in the sky. All other objects in the sky are treated as a point object. Here we yeah. have an extended object. So that's a very big, important point why solar physics is so important in the context of astrophysics as well. Okay, thank you very much. So you can continue on. Okay. So here again, it is uh, depicted here, the different payloads, uh, the locations. And as you can see, they are uh, heavily wrapped uh, with the different foils and all that. Since, uh, you know, this question was also asked, how do we protect, uh, you know, from the energetic uh, particles and radiations and so on? We do take some protections like, like this. And you can imagine these are uh, the shields which are there on the top of those uh, instruments. And this is the magnetometer. It's like a it's like a boom so which is in the folded stage now and after we reach lagrange one point we'll be uh, opening that boom and then uh, we'll start measuring it so what really you know all these institute instruments tell us when such a huge cme uh, you know uh, cmes also have different structures i'm not getting into uh, details but be aware that cmes are not a very uniform uh, you know structure there are quite a bit of variation there is a something called core then there is a void and then there is a uh, sort of sheet or shock area where you know density enhancements is there so when these different parts will cross uh, the uh, lagrange one point or our instrument you may uh, you know experience change in the field intrinsic field you can see the change in the velocities the densities the temperature these are some other parameters which will also change and uh, so this is cme there are also other structures which come from uh, from the sun and uh, their signatures are very different as compared to this. And these effects could be, you know, few hours to days. So uh, we uh, run the simulations and to see, you know, what is expected. And then when certain, uh, you know, uh, you know, things are seen something like this, then we can sort of compare with our physical models, which are there in the computer simulations and get a better understanding of the phenomena. So let me give a little movie on the scientific objectives of this mission also. Aditya L1, India's first mission to study sun, is expected to provide deeper understanding of coronal heating and solar wind acceleration, coupling and dynamics of the solar atmosphere, solar wind distribution and temperature anisotropy, and initiation of coronal mass ejections, flares, and near-Earth space weather. The Aditya L1 mission has various uniqueness. The mission will provide, for the first time, spatially resolved solar disk in near-UV band and observe CME dynamics very close to the solar disk. The mission will have onboard intelligence to detect CMEs and solar flares 
and provide directional and energy anisotropy of solar wind. The Aditya L1 mission is unique in its capabilities. The mission probes the dynamics of the coronal mass ejection close to the solar disk, which provides information on the acceleration regime of the coronal mass ejection. The mission also captures the information on the energy distribution, flux, and directionality of the solar wind. This also enables getting early information on the space weather events. We should also remember that the space is, uh, or the heliophysics is uh, really, really now covered with lots of satellites. Uh, this is a, a zoo of uh, satellites uh, flown by uh, other space agencies. And actually, we are catching up with this. Uh, thankfully, we have a comparable class mission which can compete with the, uh, with the international community. But uh, as I indicated, that sun has to be, uh, you know, studied in a uh, object within the heliophysics. That means, you know, you have all these different satellites, different uh, vantage points. Their data need to be combined to get a comprehensive understanding of the solar phenomena. So you can imagine how many people are needed for this kind of research. How much data actually uh, one individual or research scholar is actually dealing nowadays? It's, it runs into terabytes. We need heavy computational resources. We need a lot of computational skills, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you name it. You know, we have been doing this, uh, by, you know, much uh, before uh, this has been a vogue. Uh, my uh, students have been working on uh, artificial uh, detection. See, even the detection you saw from the movie, uh, you know, artificially detecting the or in, uh, onboard intelligence has been also implemented in this uh, satellite. So that mm, uh, demands, you know, a lot of uh, uh, work. I I would like to just point out that Aditya is a huge mission, but the people who build the instruments, they understand about the capabilities of the instruments and, and the science. But really, we want uh, the Aditya data to be utilized by a large community. So for that, uh, ISRO has uh, you know given Aries, uh, us, the responsibility to train many more people. So we have uh, had this uh, Aditya L1 support cell at, uh, at uh, Uttarakhand, and uh, we conduct uh, several workshops. Please uh, visit our website. And uh, uh, after the sort of the data starts flowing and all that, we'll have real data to train people, uh, answer their questions. You also need to submit your request for observations through a proposal submission system. Uh, we have to train people how to use that proposal submission system. We can also provide certain tools of solar observations, uh, uh, particularly for Aditya's mission. So this is a uh, you know a support cell uh, which is there that, uh, at uh, Aries, and you are free to please uh, contact me for further thing. Please visit the website. Again, uh, this is a lifetime experience. Uh, you know, I have been involved with this mission uh, for almost two decades, and this was a one milestone in my life to be part of this uh, you know uh, this mission launch. We are still going and uh, the work still, uh, uh, you know, it just started, I would say, for us. Uh, and we are looking forward to work with, uh, you know, uh, all of you. This is a very recent uh, uh, measurement from the uh, one of the uh, X-ray payloads called Helios. We have already observed the flares. And what is uh, plotted here is the, the Helios light curve uh, means, you know, there's uh, fluxes in X-rays compared with two uh, NASA satellites called GOES. And you can see these flares, the peaks of these, you know, these are still not fully calibrated and all that because we have not still uh, reached L1. But uh, time to time for health check, uh, we are opening up uh, certain instruments and uh, we are already, uh, it's very, very promising that we are already able to sort of get a very good, uh, you know, uh, uh, co-aligned uh, and uh, co-temporal uh, observations with other space missions as well. So uh, it, it's again a big journey. Uh, this is my group of uh, students and postdoc at Aries and Nainital. And I come from a beautiful place. Uh, you could see the Himalayas. I did not talk about any nighttime telescopes. Uh, uh, incidentally, Aries hosts the largest two four meter class telescope from India. So uh, we proudly uh, you know, host this. So it's a, a fantastic site 
for nighttime uh, observations, stars, galaxies, and beyond. But today, I just focused my uh, presentation on the Aditya mission and related uh, uh, solar physics. So thank you, Shruti. Uh, I am ready to take questions. Thank you, sir, for the enlightening presentation. It is very fascinating to learn more about the Aditya L1 mission that we or that we did not previously think of, learn about, know about. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the students will be having some questions, and I'll just capture a few more questions from the live chat mm -hmm. before I go to the previous questions that the students have submitted earlier. Okay. Once again, I remind the students that you can submit your questions via the Google form that we have pinned to the live chat. Or this, you can also find this Google form in the description box. Thank you very much. Now. Mm. <clears throat> so, one of the students would like to know, is there any other satellites that are similar to Aditya L1? Yeah, it's a good point. So, as I showed you this, uh, you know, particular slide, which shows that there are n number of, uh, you know, satellites looking at the sun or heliophysics. So, the first thing comes to uh, a scientist's job is to find some uniqueness or gap. Uh, so, SOHO uh, had uh, 13 instruments. But so, uh, you know, some of the instrument did not work for very long. Uh, so what is it Soho did not observe or could not observe? Similarly, what is it Parker Solar Probe is not, uh, you know, observing? What is it the Solar Orbiter, this is a European Space Agency mission, uh, is uh, not looking at the, you know, particular aspect? So we try to identify that missing area. And uh, based on that, we, uh, you know, sort of, see the feasibility of building instruments which can address that solar physics uh, unsolved problems. So in a way, there are of course certain overlap of uh, certain capabilities of uh, you know uh, instruments which are there on Aditya. This is also somewhat important to have because the particle detectors what we have have, have similarly there in the, in the ACE and the uh, satellite of uh, NASA. But then what happens is you, know, you also need that sometimes to have some overlap for a cross calibration or validation. See, whatever new uh, you know, data you are presenting, it, ha it has to be you know, verified. So that verification only happens if such a similar observations are there uh, from space at same time, at same location. So in that sense, you know, there are some overlap with, uh, with ACE. There are some overlap with... Uh, there is going to be another uh, mission uh, very uh, next year, July, uh, from European Space Agency. This is called the Prova 3 mission. That will have a, a coronagraph. And that coronagraph's field of view and imaging capability is similar to our coronagraph. But uh, that mission do not have any spectroscopic or spectropolarimetric capability. I did not go into the details of this. But uh, so there are you know, almost 80% uh, capabilities which Aditya uh, coronagraph uh, have, there is no overlap with any other mission. So we try to do that uh, and find that uniqueness. So in that particular movie also you found, you know, there were a few uh, items which were uh, highlighted as a uniqueness of our mission. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Now the next question that... Uh, oops. The next question from Tanvi in KR Mangalam's World School. She asked, like, how long will Aditya L1 is proposed to work? Yeah, it's again a very good point. So normally for any mission, there is a terminology used called nominal mission. So the nominal mission for Aditya is five years. But uh, if things go uh, all right, we expect Aditya to be there for at least uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, because that's the advantage of going to Lagrange one point because you need very little fuel to uh, be in the orbit. So uh, having said that, of course, it is a harsh environment. So there will be degradation of the you know, instruments, its capabilities and so on. So if it is still uh, you know, usable uh, with certain uh, you know, recalibrations and so on, we expect uh, that Aditya's uh, data will be able to use uh, we call it one solar cycle that is 11 years okay that's that's actually a long time for a mission yeah, yeah. incidentally soho was launched in 1995 it is still there <laughs> still there of course not all the 13 instruments uh, uh, work now but there are still few instruments uh, which is functional 
So oh, okay. uh, as, as far as the satellite is concerned, it, it can survive. That's what I said, that it does not need much uh, fuel uh, for being there in the orbit. OK. Uh, Vedant Raj Tyagi from KR Mangalam School is also asking if there will be an Aditya L2 mission. Oh, yes. Very nice. It's only going to be for you. <laughs> <laughs> so as I showed, you know, we have been uh, already started uh, talking about it. So, uh, of course, we will not go to Lagrange uh, 2 location. So it will be named something else, but it will be Aditya 2. Uh, whether we mm -hmm. go to L4 or L5, then it can be called as Aditya L4 or Aditya L5 because of the Lagrange uh, nomenclature. But if it is, uh, we are going to somewhere other vantage points, you never know. We can go out of ecliptic. Uh, we can go to other, uh, you know, uh, locations at, at solar orbiter, polar uh, uh, missions. So these are all uh, uh, discussions we have already started. Uh, primarily, we have started this discussion for you people because you will be there, I hope, uh, some of you, to take up these responsibilities and use the data from that. <laughs> Uh, thankful for the expectations. Uh, Tanishga from Sairam Vidyale is asking, is there any possibility for a satellite to land on the surface of the sun or go near the sun's surface like the Chandrayaan missions? No, it's not possible because sun's uh, atmosphere is very extremely hot and it's a plasma thing. So we will melt it uh, down before we reach even anywhere close to that. Landing is not possible. Landing is not possible. Yeah. It's only possible for planets, not for, for stars. Uh, Vedask, uh, Vedask Agrawal is from KR Mangalam is also asking, is it possible that the sun will die one day and how? Yeah, that's again a good question in the context of stellar evolution. Sun is a, uh, is a middle-aged star. So, uh, uh, and it is, you know, in, uh, we call it in main sequence. It's the middle of its life. It will become a, a red giant. It will become much, much bigger. It will emit much more energy. We will uh, cease to exist here. So it is at least a million year before uh, that can happen. So I'm sure we will kill each other before that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's another student actually has a question that's an offshoot of the previous question, which is, would the sun when it becomes a red giant, would it like swallow up the Earth? Yes, yes. So I mean, and uh, which uh, are the uh, planets? It will. I mean, it. What sense you say swallow up is a is a question. But of course, our existence will not be possible. So yeah, it will okay. be in the atmosphere. Yeah. All right then. They, uh, someone's are saying that Aditya L1 will stay approximately 1% between the Earth's and Sun's yeah. distance. Yeah. So, how, uh, what, which part of the surface of this, which part of the Sun will it study? It's going to look at all the different atmospheric layers, as I indicated. Uh, I think in the later presentation it was uh, made. So, yeah. maybe this question was asked earlier. So, we're going to look at all the uh, different layers, but remotely. We are not going to go close to the sun. So it's like a remote observation, like, you know, you have a telescope in space and looking at a far distance away. Okay. That's fascinating to know. So uh, Nabia Shukla from KR Mangalam School, Vikaspuri, is asking that it has, Aditya L1 has moving components. How can ISRO manage to avoid this uh, moving components getting damaged throughout the lifetime of the mission? Okay, this is a uh, you know thought-provoking question. You are right. So um, for different uh, you know filters uh, movements, and uh, since you asked this question, we also have spectropolarimetry capability. So there are polarizers which need to be uh, moved and so on. So there are moving components in the sense. You know, uh, some movements of uh, some parts are there to uh, take observations in different modes, uh, different configurations. But these are very heavily tested. You know, again, these uh, these motors and drives are uh, 
built in ISRO laboratories, in particular in uh, VSSC in Trivandrum. And they have done this in the, in, in the past. So this is a very uh, important, actually, question. In the, I would say in, uh, maybe 10 years back, ISRO would not have accepted uh, to have any moving parts in the, uh, in the satellite telescope. But now we are, uh, you know, uh, sort of competent enough to have uh, motors and drives and so on in space as well. Even, you know, I mean, since, uh, you know, she asked the question, the, the telescopes, uh, the, there is a front door, right? <clears throat> so the front door is closed now. So once we reach there, we have to open the door. So when you have to open the door, it is a mechanism, right? It, there are springs, there are nuts, uh, you know, uh, pulse goes and the mechanical thing has to work. And it is not one time operation. We have to, because if there are certain other uh, things we need to do in space, we need to close the door also. So these are also called multi-mode observations, uh, multiple times the same, uh, you know, moving uh, elements as to work. So uh, there are some tests, how often you can do it, how many times. So they're already tested that it should work for 500 to 1,000 times so that we have enough buffer to uh, you know, uh, run this uh, satellite for many, many years. All right. So uh, Gujan from uh, DAB Public School has this interesting question, which like we keep hearing how the sun is very hot. So he's asking like, if the sun is really hot, then why is it not able to light the galaxy or keep it warm? Oh, no. So this uh, heat uh, doesn't, uh, you know, uh, propagate through the interplanetary medium. Uh, see, the heat uh, is only you can find uh, in by conduction, right? You you hold a iron rod. Uh, you have uh, you can feel the heat when you touch the rod. If you are away from the rod, of course, there is a, a distance at which uh, it will radiate, and you will still feel the heat. But if you are a substantial distance away from the hot uh, iron rod, I've just given an example you will not uh, feel it so hot, right? So the radiation uh, falls off, uh, you know, with height or distance. So uh, the galaxy, I mean, we are in a, our own galaxy is called the Milky Way. We are in one of the uh, spiral arms of the, our own galaxy. We are away from, you know, uh, the center of the galaxy, uh, very, very far away, distance away. So uh, that, uh, you know, any star for that matter, do not have sufficient temperature to maintain the, in fact, the interplanetary space is very cold. The galaxy is much, much cooler. Yes, it's very cold. Um, going, going off the sun's temperature, uh, Sashis Gupta from KR Mangalam is asking that, if the temperature of the sun, as we mentioned, in the layers itself, it like increases mm -hmm. or it changes, they they want to know like what does does it how does the size of the sun affect this temperature change? Yeah. So as I indicated, the solar uh, you know diameter of the size uh, doesn't change in shorter time scale. It changes in uh, you know several of hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, you know uh, time scale. So at this point of time, the solar diameter is almost constant. So uh, and also the conditions inside the sun, the changes in terms of its uh, convective layer or the radiative layer or the core temperature, how much thermonuclear reactions are taking place and all that is not going to change in the uh, next, uh, say, hundreds of thousands of uh, years. Hydrogen is getting burnt into helium inside through this, uh, you know, PP chain reaction, nuclear fusion. But then uh, uh, when hydrogen gets exhausted, then, you know, higher elements will be burning. It could be helium, and then you have uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all these, uh, you know, elements uh, start uh, playing a major role. So that will happen much, much, much later. So uh, in our lifetime, we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, these change of the diameter of the sun. Having said that, this uh, plot which is shown is a very simplistic one-dimensional picture of the solar atmosphere. It is not true for everywhere. If I now look at the sun at, at this kind of region where, 
you know, you see there are a lot of presence of magnetic field on that. The profile is not going to be really, really the same. It is going to be different. I mean, these jumps and numbers are going to be somewhat different. So this is the average temperature profile of the sun, more, uh, you know, uh, closer to the, we call it quiet sun. So these are the regions where you don't have, this is a magnetic field map. These are the regions where magnetic field concentrations are not that strong. There are magnetic field, but they're much weaker. And there, probably this, you know, temperature profile is more, more appropriate, whereas this temperature profile will be very different in, in, in these regions. So for simplicity, we do this. But uh, really, if you have to do a proper justice, then you have to do uh, modeling of individual locations, it's, uh, it's temperature, densities, you have to know by uh, measurements. And we do that through spectroscopy. And uh, numerical uh, computers are now able to give us you know, much better output. It is a very average property, which is shown here. All right. So th this is a bit of jumping the gun, per se, this question. But I think it's a very interesting question. So Naksh Garg from Bal Bharati School is asking, like, what scope will uh, this ISRO, uh, will ISRO, for future mission, is this ISRO plan using what the data that RDJ mission will provide? OK. So uh, see, ISRO has always. Uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, long-term plans as well. So there are other planetary missions uh, which are there on the card. And there are also other astronomy missions uh, in the uh, future plan. Uh, in terms of the solar mission, there is nothing uh, which is uh, which is still uh, selected. We are already discussing about possibilities. Uh, there is a Gaganayan mission, which you uh, will probably, uh, you are hearing. So that's a priority now. And then there is a possibility of a, a you know Venus mission again. Okay. There will be again probably another Moon mission. Uh, there are a certain uh, mission called Dik uh, Diksha, uh, uh, which is also going to look at you know Earth's uh, you know magnetospheric uh, you know environment and so on. Uh, there is Disha. So there are uh, uh, several missions. There is also a X-ray polarimetric experiment, uh, which is expected to be launched actually uh, within the next few months, which is again going to look at uh, you know pulsars and uh, you know objects in the distant uh, locations with uh, you know X-ray uh, polarization uh, measuring capabilities and so on. So there are you know, several missions in the pipeline. Yeah. Okay. So. So, like when you, so it's not just the sun that Israel is looking to study. Israel is also looking to study other stars in the universe. Yes, yes. Okay. And one of the students, I cannot get her name, their name now, but they were asking does Israel ever plan, plan to send a satellite to the L2 point? Yeah. If, I mean, really? uh, it could be, uh, could be uh, very uh, good for a certain astronomy mission. Uh, particularly for infrared observations, because James Webb is there, as you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Still, nothing uh, is uh, sort of in a proof. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one, which even I don't think many people have thought about. Uh, Naman Meena from Sri Ram School is asking, how much fuel did it require for RJ L1 to reach the L1 point? Uh, it's a good point. So I do not have the precise numbers because there are a lot of other things which ISRO never discloses. But uh, you know, typically several hundreds of kilogram of uh, I mean fuel is there, uh, which is of different elements and all that they use it. But you know, if you could recall this uh, this configuration which I uh, which I have shown here. Uh, this is a slingshot, shot, uh, you know, uh, configuration is used for this PSLV uh, launch. We are not directly going. If we would have attempted to go directly to Lagrange, it would have required much uh, heavier engine, uh, probably a GSLV launcher, and much more fuel as well. So this, uh, I mean, this is not my expertise, uh, but what I understand is uh, doesn't demand much fuel. Having said that. They also preserve certain fuel for, for corrections because you know these are you are looking at this particular just one dimensional plot here, but when you are going to space in a three D space, you can imagine what kind of precision you need to reach uh, these kind of destinations. So there are course corrections uh, necessary 
so every time you know you have a simulation and then uh, uh, you know you have to compare with where exactly the location of the satellite how well they're matching and if there are certain uh, deviations you have to you have to uh, use the thrusters to make corrections it's like you know you change your gear in your car <laughs> and uh, by get a, a bit extra power to make that uh, course correction so in those processes sometimes you need extra fuel as you know you know in the fifth gear you you need uh, less fuel you fuel you come down to uh, second gear you need a, a little more fuel so oh, that kind of uh, contingencies are already you know always uh, loaded all right um, and that one student's asking because we mostly know that nuclear fusion is what generates the sun's heat and light. So a student is asking, how, why can we not reproduce it on Earth? Yeah, so nuclear fusion experiments are very dangerous. And as you know, uh, even the nuclear, of course, we do, uh, uh, you know, generate energy through nuclear fusion uh, and uh, any, well, any nuclear reactions are dangerous, so they happen only in this very, very small scales. And uh, because of atmospheric or sort of, you know, our uh, possible uh, bad effects, uh, these are not attempted for commercial uh, productions. Okay. Then um, Yashraj from JSS Public School is asking, what will happen if the sun doesn't rotate? Yeah, actually, in, in space, uh, no uh, object can remain without rotation. It's almost. So, of course, if sun doesn't rotate, we will not have uh, production of magnetic field. Sun will be a very boring uh, star. Uh, but uh, but it, it is almost possible because, you know, uh, uh, for dynamical, uh, you know, uh, stability, uh, uh, essentially any object in the sky is also rotating about its own axis. Oh, okay. Then, uh, Krishyang Sag, uh, Sangwan from St. Mary School would like to know what happens during the solar eclipse. Nothing. In the sense, uh, you know, moon comes in between the sun and uh, earth. Nobody else knows anything. So sun doesn't know that moon is coming. So, <laughs> so nothing uh, in terms of, of course, uh, the totality is only seen from part of the... Uh, you know, uh, locations on the, on the surface of the earth where there is Ambra and Penambra, you know, uh, these kind of configuration. Probably have drawn that in the school. But in terms of the sun, uh, nothing, uh, nothing changes because sun doesn't know moon is uh, coming on the way. So uh, solar eclipses are natural phenomena, uh, nothing to worry about. We can do some observation, uh, uh, you know, during the total solar eclipse uh, from space. Yeah, that we do. Okay. So, um, and then Anya Gol from NC Jindal Public School is asking, how will Aditya L1 help us in the future? So, as I, this is also a question that many students have been asking. So, yeah, I just thought I'll yeah. bring it up again. So, the point is, I have only tried to um, give you a few uh, sort of uh, itemized points, how Aditya mission is unique and what is the new understanding it will give. Uh, it will give us a better understanding of the why the corona is hot. Uh, the initial phase of the CAB, it gets accelerated, then it gets decelerated. I didn't go into the details. So since we are having this coronagraph uh, looking very close to the sun, for the first time, we'll be able to, you know, really monitor uh, the initial acceleration phase of the CMEs which is very important uh, for their arrival time in the Earth. Uh, the current coronagraphs in space do not have that capability of looking very close to the sun because of certain technical challenges uh, uh, they don't have. Uh, and then in the near UV wavelength, we do not have any satellite in space, which is continuously monitoring the solar radiation. As I indicated that the solar radiation is important for our uh, climate, uh, now there is a uh, you know a sort of a prediction or uh, modeling which is indicating that the near UV wavelength radiations are actually affecting our ozone and other layers uh, much more uh, uh, you know effectively. And with the solar cycle, it can vary as as high as twenty percent. So this has not been monitored, not been studied. 
So this near UV telescope called SUIT uh, will allow us to, for the first time, to look at the effect of uh, that radiation on our, our climate. And uh, I didn't again elaborate on the solar wind, which is the you know, continuous expansion of the solar outer atmosphere. Uh, in some region, you will find a solar wind of the order of uh, 300 to 400 kilometers. In the polar region, you will find it with 700 to 800 kilometers. So that means, you know, the solar wind is not a very symmetric outflow. It has a, a you know, uh, asymmetric structure. And that asymmetric structure also changes with the solar cycle. When solar maxima is there, then this, uh, you know, distribution is very different as compared to when the solar minima. So all these, uh, you know, solar wind properties, its, uh, it's uh, topological structures, directional properties, all these will be possible to be studied if we are there at Lagrange 1 point for a very long period of time. Because often, you know, uh, the smaller satellites do not have the possibility of looking continuously. Even uh, the low Earth orbit satellites have eclipses, so they can't look at the sun uh, 24 by 7, 365 days. So Lagrange 1 is a very good vantage point for such observations as well. So uh, like that, you know, there are really, really several uh, pieces of thing which we uh, last 20 years we have been <laughs> dreaming of, of addressing when the solar, uh, you know, Aditya data starts uh, flowing. Okay. Looking forward to that data because it will be really interesting to know more about the sun and our closest star. So uh, Arna Navin from HLC International School is asking, what's the closest we can get to the sun yeah so uh, so far you know partner solar probe is still uh, you know going towards so 0 0.3 uh, 0 0.28 uh, solar radii uh, 0 0.38 au au is the astronomical unit which is the sun earth distance so you can imagine that uh, almost uh, more than 70 percent of the distance we can travel through the parker solar probe uh, I don't think we have uh, such capabilities yet. Um, and Parker Solar Probe is primarily for the solar wind, uh, you know, science, not for, you know, real solar uh, thing which we are doing from Aditya. So that way it is always complementary to, you know, uh, to our observations as well. Okay. So basically the information from the Parker so, uh, will help verify right. what RDG L1 has and RDG L1 can also verify what Parker right. has. Right. Right. Okay, so uh, Pr Pranshul from Sri Ram World School is asking which layer of the sun, with how many layers of the sun and what they are, as well as which is the one that gives the solar flare. Yeah, so as I indicated already in my uh, earlier presentation uh, slides, that uh, the photosphere is the visible surface of the sun. And then we have the chromosphere, which is about 2,000 kilometer and so on so that's much a laser i mean later stages of uh, you know uh, you know of the uh, stellar evolution okay uh, let me just get some more questions i guess the this may be one of the last few questions since we yeah, have to yeah i have to leave in 5 minutes because i have yeah. another panel to attend so, so Let 
<laughs> I mean, people can always uh, write to me. Uh, my email you can share with the students. Okay, sure. Uh, I'll attach your email to the description of the video so that the kids can easily contact you through that. Right. Uh, so one student, which I guess for us is easy to answer, but the student is asking, can the earth also give up something like a solar storm? Earth cannot give a solar storm because Earth's atmosphere uh, is not uh, having such magnetic field, uh, you know, concentration. So solar flare comes because of the interaction about uh, different magnetic uh, field lines, and uh, the magnetic field in the Earth is very weak. It's it's uh, really really a millionth time weaker than what is there in sunspot. Yeah. All right. Okay, then this may this will be the last question, I suppose, for the uh, uh, session. Which uh, one of the students, Tanmay from Cambridge Court High School, is asking, what are filaments in the sun, and what exactly is plasma? Okay, so plasma is the uh, state of matter uh, beyond uh, you know it's a beyond gaseous state. So if you go on increasing the temperature of any object, uh, then it becomes a collection of uh, electrons, protons, and neutrals, neutrals. And collectively, they are called plasma state. And in the universe, 99.9% .9 of the universe is actually in the plasma state uh, because uh, either the collisions are not there or you know the temperature is too high. Uh, so for astrophysical purposes, majority of the physics need to be done with the plasma physics, uh, you know, kind of equations and so on. Filaments are uh, magnetic structures in the solar uh, chromosphere primarily. So they're seen as uh, through the H alpha, uh, this is again a hydrogen line uh, filter. Uh, traditionally, of more than 100 years, we have been observing filaments. They're like magnetic clouds floating on the on the atmosphere of the sun and uh, because of the gain uh, certain magnetic uh, configuration the magnetic field uh, and the material is trapped into trapped into those uh, uh, filamentary kind of uh, structures and they're called the filaments okay then this is one last question which i literally just saw which i think is interesting to ask and we can just finish it off which is which are the parts in space will be will it be good to observe the sun not counting the lagrange one point yeah so now you see uh, this is a very good question because whatever so far if you are seeing even if you are going to lagrange one point we are on the sun earth line in the same ecliptic plane so when we are looking at the sun we are only looking at one face of the sun so uh, even if something comes from the solar disk as a coronal mass ejection we are seeing them on the plane of the sky. We are actually not having a correct estimate about the motion or the speed with which it is coming. So it's actually a huge limitation if you are only observing from one vantage point, even from Lagrange one point. So yeah. what is important is to uh, look at the sun from different vantage points. So L4 and L5 is again another good vantage point. The other is go out of ecliptic plane. If you go out of the ecliptic plane, then you can see the sun from higher latitude. So then you will be able to get a better understanding of the polar regions of the sun. Oh. Because a lot of interesting things happen in the pole of the sun. Uh, as you have heard about why our Chandra and Moon mission, we were targeting to go to the uh, to closer to the pole. We have only gone up to 70 plus. Uh, so it is challenging. And earlier uh, lunar missions also couldn't achieve that. So this is again would be probably another uh, interesting uh, you know mission uh, trajectory which we could follow. Go out of ecliptic plane and look at the sun from uh, above the uh, ecliptic plane for a you know better understanding. It's a it will provide you a three D uh, you know view of the sun. You have one uh, from the top, one in the ecliptic plane, one from some other, some other vantage point. So you will do a stereoscopy to get a better uh, handle of these uh, you know uh, things coming out of the sun. Okay, that is very fascinating to know, actually. But unfortunately, it looks like our time to with you has come to an end, and this this means the session is over. Thank you for your time, Professor Banerjee. It is very enlightening to have you with us. And I'd like to thank to all the students who has participated and asked such interesting questions. 
that has made even us learn more about the RHL1 mission. And thank you for your participation in Space India Space Explorers Workshop. And we'll see you again for the next time.